BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and those taking part are Anne Scott James, Dillis Powell, Dennis Norden, and Frank Muir. We go straight into round one, which tries to test their vocabularies. Two marks, they get the meaning of these words roughly right. Beginning with Anne Scott James. Anne, the meaning of the word concatenation. Of circumstances is the only phrase yes, I can associate that's fair it enough. with. It means a linking together. That's it. Union by linking together uh, in a kind of chain, though it's used figuratively and not literally normally. Two marks, well done. Frank Miller, what is a portmanteau word? Um, yes, well, a portmanteau gives it to you, doesn't it? It's, it's from the French. Port, man, toe. <laughs> and when port goes to a man's toe, <laughs> he gets gout. <laughs> and gout is, is a portmanteau word for get out. <laughs> gout. <laughs> and it, it's, it's two words or more shoved together. Uh, Frank's right. It, it's a word made by combining parts of two or more different words to express a combined meaning and uh, blending the sounds too. Lewis Cowell did it. L slithy, uh, which is a mixture between lithe and slimy, probably, which comes in the Jabberwock in uh, Through the Looking Glass. Chortle was even nicer. Chortle was a mixture between chuckling and snorting. Or outside Lewis Carroll, there's squarson, which is a mixture between a squire and a parson. All right, Dennis Powell. Corrected. What is an elixir? Elixir is a drink. Well, rather rashly, but... Uh, yes. Well, it's a reviving drink. <laughs> elixir Very. of life. And what's that do to you? It uh, makes you young again and brings you back to life and to youth and to beauty yeah. and to health and happiness and to Frank. For how long? <laughs> <laughs> Practically forever. <laughs> no, all right. Um, that's one of the two meanings, and I'll give you a two marks. Um, elixir, not elixir of life, which is quite correctly described by Delis, which is a, a potion designed to prolong life indefinitely, if anybody wants there. Um, but an elixir by itself, or the elixir, was an alchemist's preparation, the idea being to change base or non-gold metals into gold. It never seemed to work, but they were always trying to get it. Dennis Norton. What is oris? Oh, it's something to do with oris root. It's the other end of an oris root. <laughs> yes. Um, an oris root, I know nothing about. Oh, it's about. used in making face powder. Yes, it is. Hmm. Do you know what flower it comes from? Or plant? The I mean, oris root, I had a wild guess. I would say it comes from the oris. <laughs> plant. It does. So would I. No. Uh, I rather think that Anne knows this No, one. I would absolutely agree. It comes from the oris. No, uh, one and a half. It, oris is a kind of iris, and nobody knows why it became oris from being iris. And as you quite rightly said, oris root is a fragrant root, usually three species of iris, used in perf perfumery and in medicine. One and a half. Now, before we begin round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down, and the two women members of this team will, I hope, go on studying those quotations, because at the end of the programme, I shall ask them the source of the quotation. Anne Scott James and Dennis Norden. Here's yours. Festina Lente. Festina Lente. And Dillis Bauer and Frank Muir. Oh. Here's yours. The Battle of Waterloo was won in the playing fields of Eton. And then at the end of the programme, I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their idea of how these came to be said or written. We go on now to round two, which is about legend and mythology. Two marks for correct answers. Anne Scott James, who was Uranus or Uranus? Oh, he came very early on, didn't mm, he? Terribly. I think he was the heaven and he was born yes. about around the time that Chaos was born. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or he was the son of Chaos, possibly. You yes. pre the Olympic, the gods of Olympus, That's right. anyway. Yes. Yes. That, and you've well, got the, do. the main thing, which is absolutely right, too. In, in Greek mythology, it was the same as heaven, and he was both son and husband, which must have been a bit complicated, of Gi or Gia, the earth, 
and father of the Titans, and one of whom was Kronos, and he was a rather curious father. He didn't want his children to see the light at all, and so he hid them in the depths of the earth, and his wife, Gear, didn't like that at all, and so incited the son, Kronos, to emasculate him, and that was roughly the end of the story. Now, Frank Noah, what was the Lernian Hydra? Lernian Hydra. I don't know about the Lernian one, but Hydra, the Hydra-headed... Yes. They had, um, uh, if you chopped their head off, uh, another couple grew. That's it. So they, were, they foiled the attacker, hence Hydra foil. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <coughs> my delicious partner also adds they lived in a swamp. Yes. Do you remember who the attacker was? Ah. <laughs> what? Mm. Heracles. I think so. Heracles. <laughs> Eldo. All right, two marks. The Lernian Hydra was a water snake, a monstrous water snake, um, which ravaged the country around this swamp of Lerna, which you can find there now. It's just near Argos and opposite Navprion. And it had nine heads, and the middle one, which was cheating, was immortal and couldn't be <laughs> killed. And it was one of the labors of Hercules to do away with the Hydra. And he kept on striking off the heads, and as Frank quite rightly says, every time he did, two grew in their place. And so he got some help from his servant, Iolaus, and managed to cauterize the wound every time he cut the head off, and that stopped the new ones growing. But the immortal one, he couldn't do much with except just put it under a rock and hide it there forever. Now, <laughs> Delisbeau, who was Hebe? H-E-B-E. Hebe. Hebe was the cupbearer of the gods. And goddess of? Youth. Mm. Two marks it is. <clears throat> Hebe was the goddess of eternal youth, daughter of Zeus and Hera. She was cupbearer to the gods. She had the power of rejuvenating you, if that was what you wanted. And eventually, <laughs> small world in those days, she married Hercules when he became a god. Dennis Norton, who was Kier? K-E-R. This was Greek? A Greek? Greek. You sure? I mean, I... <laughs> Change a Greek word. Well, I think it was a member of the... Scottish National Tourist Board on, <laughs> stationed on Mount Olympus <laughs> to encourage travel. Mm. Yes, you're getting very close. And was changed into a sporran. <laughs> when by you cut it off. By Heracles. Yes. Yes. Heracles. And every time you cut the sporran off, three sporran <laughs> grew in its place. But how did Heracles beat that one? And they took the poisoned bile, and it's known as porridge. <laughs> <laughs> Seven marks, please. Well, half a mark for sheer invention. <laughs> Kerr was the Greek goddess of death, particularly violent death in battle. And uh, when you get accounts of battles in Homer, you had several of them around, clad in blood-stained garments and dragging the dead and the wounded off the field of battle. Now a round of verse and poetry, and in this round I give each member of each team a quotation and ask them to complete it with the next line or two. Two marks if they can finish off the quotation, and two more for correctly naming the source. And Scott James. The curfew tolls the knell of the parting day. The lowing herd winds slowly o'er the lee. Well, methinks it is Gray's elegy. Yes. Well, the ploughman <coughs> homeward plods well, his weary, weary way. way. And leaves the world to darkness and, and to me. me. Absolutely right. You get your four marks. Cha, cha, cha. I don't think it was the most difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Not the most difficult one in the world, I didn't think. Um, Thomas Gray's elegy written in a country churchyard. The curfew tolls the knell of parting day. The lowing herd winds slowly o'er the lee. The ploughman homeward plods his weary way and leaves the world to darkness and to me. Now, Frank Muir. <coughs> when Britain first, at heaven's command, arose from out the azure main... A rose from out the azure man. A rose from out the azure man. Last night at the ponds, didn't it? You can see us standing there with the loo rolls flying through the air. This was the something, the something of the... Three and a half for harmony. Oh, no, I think two and a half. You haven't given me the author yet. The author? No, I don't. It's a very surprising person. Yes, it is. Thompson. Thompson. It's Seasons Thompson, isn't it? Thompson, it is. It's Thompson. It's Seasons Thompson. Rule Britannia by James Thompson, the elder, because there was another one who wrote about 100 years later or nearly. 
Uh, when Britain first at heaven's command arose from out the azure main, this was the charter of the land, and guardian angels sung this strain. Da, da, rule da, da, Britannia, da, da, da. <laughs> rule the waves. Not the second Britannia, that only comes into the <laughs> singing. Britons never <laughs> will be slaves. Yes. <laughs> Three and a half. Dillis Bow. Quit, quit for shame. This will not move. This cannot take her. If of herself she will not love, nothing we'll can make her. her. I knew that much. <laughs> Why did you give me the bit I knew? What have I got? I've got to go on, have Yes, I? it's uh, nothing can make her, and it's quite an easy The devil one. take her. That's right. We've finished it off. Now, do you remember the author? No, I don't. Two and a half. Sir John Suckling. Ah. Song oh, from uh, Aglora. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> Two and a half. <laughs> Dennis Norton. Fear no more the lightning flash, nor the all dreaded thunder stern. Fear not slander, censure rash. Thou hast finished joy and moan. <laughs> well, I don't know whether it's this verse, but one of the verses ends golden lads and girls all must as chimney sweepers Quite come right. to dust. Yes. It's not the same verse, but that's the very... That's, one, that's the end, that's the one of the verses. Yep. Ends like that. Uh, it author, starts, uh, fear no more the heat of the sun, nor yeah. the furious winter's rage. That's it. Jizz. Um, author and play. With Shakespeare. <coughs> Remember the play? It's a song towards the end of Cymbeline. Quite right. Oh, marvellous. Well done. Well we had it. We had it on the floor, please. <laughs> <coughs> we had it. Two weeks. Next two lines are a bit difficult. Three out of four, I think. We're putting him in for a scholarship. <laughs> <laughs> Shakespeare, the song from Cymbeline, <laughs> sung by Guiderius and Arviragus over the supposed death. Um, fear no more the lightning flash, nor the all-dreaded thunderstone. Fear not slander, censure rash. Thou hast finished joy and moan. All lovers young, all lovers must consign to thee and come to dust. Terribly Next. like house. Sorry. <laughs> Terribly like Houseman. It is, very like Houseman, indeed. And you've got the two nicest lines about the golden lads and girls. <laughs> well, now a quickie round of initials or abbreviations. Two marks, if you can tell me what the following represent. Anne Scott James, F.D. It's not the legendary farmer's daughter. <laughs> <laughs> the one on the penny, Fidei yes. Defender. Oh, fid yes, the Defender of the Faith, yes. Two marks. <laughs> Fidei Defensor, which defender of the faith, which oddly enough, because the Roman Catholics don't agree with this, uh, was first assumed as a title by Henry VIII, who broke away from the Church of Rome. Frank Muir, S.I. S.I.? Mm. Special investigator. <laughs> I'll give you a slight help. K.C.S.I. Knight Commander. Yes. Of the... The Star. Star. Of, the, of the Star of India. Absolutely right, yes. It was the Order of the Star of India, which is uh, lapsed now that we don't run India. I thought it but was a pub. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, it only exists in that form in that case, Dennis. Anyway, uh, Order of the Star of India. Dillis Powell, A.V., capital letters, A.V. A.V.? Army? No. No? Association? No. To be contrasted with R V. Authorised version. That's it. Ah, ah. <laughs> One and a half marks. Ah. They gave quite a lot ah. of help. A V is the authorised version of the Bible, as opposed to the R V, which is the re revised version. <laughs> Dennis Norton. R I. Rhode Island. Yes. It is. Hello. Yeah. Mm. It's quite a lot of things. Rhode Island, Royal Institute of Painters and Watercolours, Religious Instruction in Schools, and Rex et Imperator, which you used to have on some of the coins when we, the king or queen was Emperor of India. Now, well, now we come to the last round and go back to those two quotations I gave the teams earlier in the programme. For two marks, Anne Scott James, can you give me the origin of your quotation, Festina Lenti? Well, it means hurry slowly. It was presumably yes. said by a Roman. Yes, it was. But whether it's a poet or a historian, I do not know. Historian it is. Well, that Chap with a very choice. odd name. Very what? Very odd name. It sounds like it's to do with puddings. That means it can't be Livy Pudding, Suetonius. <laughs> <laughs> I helped a bit. Uh, one and a half. Help? <laughs> uh, Suetonius, Roman historian, uh, in a book called Divus Augustus, the Augustus the Emperor Divine, 
and festina lenti means make haste slowly. Could have been always. <laughs> <laughs> always from the point of Yes, yeah. it's always a good bet, but not this time. Uh, Dennis Powell, like the origin of your quotation, please. The Battle of Waterloo was won in the playing fields of Eton. Well, it was somebody who was alive after 1815. Mm. <coughs> <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> Wellington. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> uh, uh, yes. What was Wellington? Well, it probably wasn't, but um, never mind. Could have been Wellington. That's good. It's a tribute. For marking purposes, it was Wellington. <laughs> <laughs> the saying the Battle of Waterloo was won in the playing fields of Eton has always been attributed to the first Duke of Wellington who won the battle, but uh, a later Duke, who no doubt also had been at Eton, uh, said this was quite untrue. But it was quoted by a Frenchman, Montalembert, in a book he wrote about the political future of the English. So you get to two marks, although it's probably wrong. <laughs> well, now I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their explanations of how these quotations came into being, and on this occasion the marks will go to whichever unlikely explanation receives the longer applause from the audience here in the theatre. So back to Dennis Norden with his quotation, Festina Lenti. It really is a darn shame about Suetonius. <laughs> uh, you, you, you notice the kind of disparaging way in which Jack spoke of him. This was Suetonius's fate all his life. As in first place, he's only remembered because this ridiculous phrase, Festina Lente, make haste slowly, is attributed to him. And it is an absurd phrase, make haste slowly. It's absolutely nonsense, because it's like saying drink in moderation, you know. <laughs> and, but all his life, you see, Suetonius had a bad time. In the first place, as Jack said, being born with this name. You know, at that time, when, when all the other Romans had these wonderful, romantic, sort of executive-sounding names like Brutus and Julius and Marcus Aurelius, there he was... Suetonius. <laughs> you know, he used to wish, he, he used to think to himself, if I had a, had to have a soppy sounding Roman name, why couldn't it have, why couldn't it have been something with a bit of an edge to it, you know, like lascivious, <laughs> you know, or infamous, you know, even miscellaneous. You know. <laughs> but Suetonius, you know, obviously with a name like that, he had no chance at all of ever getting anywhere in Roman life. And so, of course, obviously, from the start, he was warped, introverted and shy and didn't even try to do anything and spent all his time simply hanging round the public baths. <laughs> now, make no mistake about this, the public baths in Roman days were nothing like the public baths today that we have. The Roman public baths were absolutely splendiferous, which was another name Suetonius used to be quite familiar <laughs> called Splendipro, you know, and, and uh, they, they, they were all marbled and they had these slaves who would dry your back and squeeze out your loofah, you know, <laughs> and of course a great thing was, of course, that men and women used to bath together because you know, the Roman democratic principle was founded on the theory that if there are differences, they should be aired. Um, <coughs> so, of course, it was no hardship hanging around that type of public bath, but Suetonius, being so shy, didn't actually bath at all. He just used to sort of sit at the side and read a parchment or something, which, which isn't easy in a very busy public bath because the hot steam makes it go all soggy. You know? <laughs> and one day... He was sitting there reading, thinking, I wouldn't even mind being called erroneous, you know. <laughs> and suddenly he noticed these two young girls come out of the public bath, and one of them came up to him and said, uh, Is this slab vacant? And he says, Please do. You know. And she sat down and she said, I see you here a lot. She said, Aren't you the, uh, aren't you the chap who's always reading the soggy parchment? <laughs> and he said, Yes. And she said, Don't you ever go in the bath? And he said, well, no, I don't. And she said, why not? And he said, well, I don't really like to. And she said, well, that's ridiculous. He thought, ridiculous? No, I'm a suetonious. <laughs> um, she said, it, 
There is nothing to be ashamed of in nakedness. The human body is the noblest work of nature. And you said, but it's not actually my body I'm ashamed of, it's, it's my vest. <laughs> you see, this is another thing you have to know about Roman life. In those days, the washing of clothes was deemed a woman's job. So unless a man had a wife or a girlfriend, he never actually got his smalls done at all, you see. <laughs> so as in Suetonius's case, his vest was apt to look a bit crummy, you know, especially after about seven or eight years. And this girl said to him, it is a shame, isn't it? She said, oh, chap like you should be able to have somewhere where he could get his vest washed. And that was where Suetonius had the idea for which he should be remembered instead of for this ridiculous line. He conceived the idea of a laundry. Why not get together a group of high-minded young ladies who would wash the vests of those unattached bachelors who had nobody else to do it for them in return for a couple of solidarii or denii or whatever, you see. <laughs> and so he got together these girls to do it, and they were known as the Vestal Virgins. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and so established his fortune. Now, don't you think that he should be remembered for that rather than for this ridiculous, nonsensical Festina Lente? He should be remembered for being the first man to say something of very much more use which is vest in a laundry. <laughs> There's going to be some hasty re-scribbling by Roman historians after that one. <laughs> and now we go back to Frank Muir, and if you remember, his quotation was the the Battle of Waterloo was won on the playing fields of Eton. Everything about the story I'm going to tell you is absolutely true. Um, it was the time when um, my wife and I had a boat, a boat in which we used to travel on the canals and rivers of England. And uh, I can't keep on saying my wife, and I'll tell you her name. She had a very curious name for, for a girl, uh, Mrs. Muir. <laughs> um, <coughs> I used to call her Polly for short. And um, Polly and I were on a holiday on our boat, and we'd gone upstream. Uh, we were very late, and darkness had set in, and we stopped just short of Windsor, just, in fact, by the playing fields of Eton. And we tied up, very late, we tied up right underneath an overhanging ledge of earth um, and grass, and, we'd, and we tied up and, and bedded down for the night. Now, uh, my wife was very tired because uh, pulling a canal boat is... <laughs> you know, isn't easy. Not only that, and the, the, uh, the loop and the rope had chafed her neck and, and she... Uh, uh, she had to pull it because uh, steering is a question of decisions all the time, you know, whether to, whether to push the thing to the right or the left. And it's, it's much better that I cope with that sort of thing. <laughs> And so she was very tired, and she turned in first and went to sleep almost immediately. And we had a double bunk. And I went to sleep, but I was woken, and I, I, I awoke humming. It's a very unusual thing to do, you know. <laughs> but I awoke humming, plunk, 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 plunk. I awoke humming that, and I had a, a slightly painful nose and a cold nose. And after a while, I realised that the boat was leaking slightly and the water was dripping upon my nose to the rhythm of plunk, 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 plunk. <laughs> after a while, I realised what it was that had been dripping through. It was water. <laughs> and I thought that it was water, and that we were here underneath the playing fields of Eton. And it was water which had come from those fields, which had been, were being, had been trodden on by the aristocracy of England. To think that the very water which was about to drip through our roof had probably wetted the jerseys of our rulers. <laughs> and I rushed and got an empty beer bottle out of the bilges, 
and by judicious use of the boat hook, I rolled my wife out of the bed and onto the floor. It's quite a drop, but she's a heavy sleeper, as I say. <laughs> and I, I tore the mattress off, balanced this empty beer bottle beneath the, beneath the drip, and collected this water. And in the morning, I put the cork in and I saved it. And you know, it now has a place of honour in my lovely home. I've made a sort of shrine for it, just above the television set. And there it sits. And one day, you know, some famous person might be Lady Lewisham, or it might be Lou Grade. But they're going to come and they say, they're going to say, what a lovely home you have. And after that, they'll say, what is that beer bottle of dirty water doing in that obviously honoured position? And I will look at them, and I will say with pride, thinking of its aristocratic connections, I will say, the bottle of water, Lou, was rain in the playing fields of Eton. <laughs> well, no wonder the public schools are in danger. Um, <coughs> Well, by your vote, Dennis Norden just wins the contest of the two stories, and this brings us to a final score in which he and Anne Scott James win by one and a half marks from Frank Muir and Dillis Powell, and it also brings to an end this edition of My Word. <laughs> In my word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir and Dennis Norden, introduced by Jack Longland. The program was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC. BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and those taking part are Anne Scott James, Dillis Powell, Frank Muir, and Dennis Norton. Here's round one to test their vocabulary. Two marks if they get these words roughly right, meanings. We begin with our Anne Scott James. The meaning of effendi. Oh, it's a Turkish word. Yes. It's a sort of bigwig. Yes, that'll do. Two marks it is. Turkish title of respect applied to, you take a deep breath, government officials and members of learned professions. It comes from a Greek word in turn, which meant somebody who does something himself. Uh, how that applies to government officials, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on to Frank now. The meaning of irenicon. Icon is a is a thing you stick on the wall and uh, um, a sort of worship, isn't it? Kind of image. Image, yes. Yes, yes I wouldn't go too far along that line. No. I think so it helps Irene you is a sort of photograph yeah. of a girlfriend called Irene. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you stick to, you stick to your piece. girlfriend, Frank. We're getting closer. Piece. Well, I really is a piece. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> a kind of concord, kind of peace arrangement. Yes, you're getting very close indeed. Peace Come arrangement. On, Dill, this is your uh, part of the Mediterranean. Of One and a half out of two. It's a proposal tending towards making peace or reconciling differences, and as um, Frank quite rightly says, it comes from that Greek girl, Irene, who is peace. <laughs> Dennis Powell, what is couvard? Well, that's a kind of hatching process. Yes. When I was 
a, a very... Careful. Hundreds of years ago. <laughs> hundreds of years ago, and I used to read a thing called Ocasay Nicolette. There yes. was a couvard in that. And the case, the uh, case occurred that the gentleman took to bed yes. when his wife was going to lay the egg or have the baby. That's absolutely right. Yes, you've got that. It's all right, too. It's a custom of certain people. Perhaps, I'm told primitive people, but I'm not saying that's true. But the husband either feigns illness or just does definitely feel jolly ill uh, at the time when his wife is about to have a baby and is put to bed. And <laughs> as uh, Dillis quite rightly says, it comes from an old French word meaning to hatch. Um, <laughs> Dennis Norton, who or what is a mower? M-O-A. <laughs> <laughs> I hate it when they say who or what. <laughs> well, you know, Samoa. Um, uh, you know, Samoa. <laughs> it's what's left of Samoa when you when you get rid of Sam. <laughs> so in no. the right latitudes, it sounds like a kind of Polynesian word. It's either it's a thing which cuts grass skirt. <laughs> 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 It's one of those long-legged birds. Oh, it's yeah. a long-legged bird. Which run. Yes. Which run. And, and where did it run? <laughs> In Australia? Where did, yes. yes, well done. Jolly good. Oh, Two good. marks you get. Well done, you're home. Um, it's the Maori name for a bird which is otherwise called the Dinornis. And that was um, a bird uh, It meant a terrible bird. That's the Greek background of it. Um, extinct since the 17th century, but really much too large for anybody to believe even then. The biggest one stood 12 feet high and weighed 500 pounds, which is rather a lot. Anne Scott James, the meaning of libidinous. Cor. Oh. Oh. Well, it means licentious, lustful. All right, Full of disgraceful desires. Lustful, lecherous. Two marks, another Latin word. Thank you, sir. What is a hemistick? H e m i s t i c h hemistick. I c h ick. <laughs> yes, it, it's a slight clue. Perhaps your partner will help you. Half a verse. <laughs> Half a verse. No, F to write a verse. <laughs> Two marks. Made it a verse that is half a verse. It's. It's half of a line, a normal line of verse, or a verse which is written in extremely short lines, and it means what it says. It's two Greek words meaning half of a line or verse. Two marks, well done. Dennis Powell, what is the meaning of sui line? S-U-I-L-L-I-N-E, sui line. Sui line? Mm -hmm. It has properties <laughs> appertaining to sui <laughs> <laughs> All we've got to do is find out what sewer. Sewer, yes. yes. And, and uh, that you know, in fact. Tell us, we try hard. It's Greek. Is it? Latin. Latin, Latin. Latin. yes. Suet, as in pudding. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're getting closer here. Yes. Suetonius, probably. Yeah. Um, Puddingy. Is it, is it, it something... Would, it would be pretty puddingy if you let it grow up, grow up and gave it uh, as much to eat as you normally do. It's no, you're not going to get it. No, Sorry. I'm not, no. Suet is Latin for a pig. So ah. sui line is pertaining Porky. to the hog family, ah. or porcine, porcine, or whatever you call it. Ah. I can't give you any marks. No. Pig <laughs> 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 right, back to Dennis Norton. What is a saltarello? A saltarello, Jack, is um, an Italian crime. It's uh, a saltarello and a batteria. <laughs> 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 no, no. I just think it's a dance, wouldn't yes. you? Yes, A sort it's of jumping sul kind of dance. Yes. Also from the Latin, to jump. Yes, right? yes, yes, you've got it. You're all right. It's a jump it, dance. It's an Italian or Spanish dance for one couple at a time with sudden skips or jumps. And it comes from an Italian word meaning a jumping cracker or squib. Two marks. Uh, before we begin round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down, and the two women members of the team will, I hope, go on studying those quotations, because at the end, I shall ask them where the quotations come from. So, Anne Scott James and Dennis Norton, here's your quotation. One volunteer is worth ten pressed men, and Dillis Powell and Frank, here's yours. I come from haunts of Coot and Hearn. And then at the end of the program, I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their ideas of how these came to be said or written. 
The second round's about verse and poetry. I give each member of each team a quotation and ask them to complete it for the next line or two. Two marks if they can finish off the quotation and two more for correctly naming the source. Beginning with Anne Scott James. I dreamed that as I wandered by the way, bare winter suddenly was changed to spring and gentle odours led my steps astray. It's the introductory verse of the Dead Sea Scroll. <laughs> 19th century. 19th century. Think about those romantics. Shelley. Yes, Shelley it is. <laughs> well, Shelley, as we yes. so swiftly mm. said. It's a poem of Shelley's called The Question. I dreamed that as I wandered by the way, bare winter suddenly was changed to spring and gentle odours led my steps astray, mixed with the sound of waters murmuring along a shelving bank of turf. Frank Muir. They say it was a shocking sight after the field was won, for many thousand bodies here lay rotting in the sun. Uh, but this, this sort of thing must be, said he, after a famous victory. Yes. It's northy. Mm -hmm. um, or southy. Yes. Um, <laughs> it's a poem on the... A marvellous poem, actually, on the Battle of Blenheim. Quite right. Um, Robert Southey's poem on the Battle of Blenheim they say it was a shocking sight after the field was won, for many thousand bodies here lay rotting in the sun, but things like that, you know, must be after a famous victory. Adelis Powell. God doth not need either man's work or his own gifts. Who best bear his mild yoke, they serve him best. His state is kingly, thousands at his bidding speed, and post or land and ocean, an ocean without rest. They also serve yes. who only stand and wait. And author and poet. Milton on his blind. Yes, really good. Well done. Now, mm. Dennis Norton. Physicians of the utmost fame were called at once, but when they came, they answered as they took their fees. I don't know. It sounds... Is it Goldsmith? Or... No, much later. Belloc. Belloc. Yep. Belloc. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's Hela Belloc in cautionary tales, the tale of Henry King and the chief defect of Henry King was oh, chewing little bits, bits of, of string. string. So physicians of the utmost fame were called at once, but when they came, they answered as they took their fees, there is no cure for this disease. Well, then we have a round of origins and derivations, and three marks, if members of the team can define the present meaning first, and then give me the origin and derivation of these words or phrases. Um, Anne Scott James, what are pinks, and why are they so called? Do you mean the flowers? I would prefer the flowers. The flowers of the Dianthus tribe. Yes. Pinking shear yes. means something, means going clip, clip, That's right. clip. The frilly edges round the Absolutely uh, petals. Absolutely right. Well done, Anne. <laughs> Jolly good. <laughs> Pinks are hardy perennial flowers, favourite for borders, closely allied to carnations, and I didn't know they were the Dianthus family, but Anne did. But they're not called pinks because they were pink, because most of them, in fact, are white, and there can be lots of other colours as well. And they're called pinks because the edges are, of the petals are pinked or scalloped in this way. It is quite different from hunting pink. Now, Frank Muir, there's a rosemary. That's for remembrance. It comes from a, a filial speech, isn't it? Yes, in Hamlet. Um... It's the language of flowers, Jack. Yeah. That's, um, uh, that's ro ro red roses for love. Mm -hmm. uh, dandelion, don't come indoors. <laughs> <laughs> a, a daisy, you know. It's, yes. it's mm. just uh, one of these old traditional things. Yes, I think that's good enough. Um, Ophelia in Hamlet, when mad or half mad, says this, there's Rosemary, that's from Remembrance, together with a great deal more of shrewdness and madness mixed but the old tradition was that this herb of rosemary strengthened the memory it was used in essence it's called hungary water to steady the nerves and in the language of flowers to which frank referred it means fidelity in love there is powell pommy p-o-m-m-i-e pommy pommy is an australian word yeah uh, applied to english immigrants yes and I've always thought they had 
though I, I oh, doubt if they're supposed to have rather pink complexions. Look like apples, is that so? Yes, but... Oh, I see, yes. Um, pink apple-cheek complexions? Why are they talking French? Yes, uh, yeah. I, yes, stick to this line of thanks. It isn't apples Go normally. On. Were they p- potato? Potato. <laughs> <laughs> complexions like mashed potatoes. Potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, um, another I fruit which is pink and white. Ah, oh, um... Pomegranate. Pomegranate. Yes. Pomegranate. But that's... Yes, that'll Spanish. do. <laughs> um, Granada. Pommy is the Australian North. or New Zealand term for an Englishman, an English immigrant. Can be used affectionately or with intent to insult. Uh, one theory is that given by Dillis Powell, that when the English immigrants arrived in Australia, they did show up pretty pink and white as compared with the more leathery and bronze skins of the people actually living there. In fact, it might be a mixture of Pommy of immigrant and pomegranate or it might be a corruption of tommy or a blend of jimmy and tommy <laughs> there are all sorts of theories about this anyway you get your three marks because you've given one of the well-known theories pommy <laughs> <laughs> well think that one out <laughs> dennis norton sadism oh, one that i know <laughs> <laughs> uh, one definition of a sadist is somebody who won't hurt a masochist. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's a pretty one. I yeah. like that. <laughs> it's somebody who likes inflicting pain and it's named after the Marquis de Sade who lived in the 19th century and was a sort of sportsman of the year. <laughs> um, <laughs> 18th and 19th century. Yes, okay. Actually, yes, yeah. okay. Um, he wrote Justine mm. and A Hundred Days of Sodom and various other paperbacks, which are <laughs> now going like a bomb under our new liberal censorship law. <laughs> I wish I could give you a bonus, Mark. Yes, I'd make an extra, please. <laughs> but certainly that. a three. Um, sadism, non medical, not very scientific term, for obtaining of sexual satisfaction through inflicting mental or physical pain on other persons or animals. That's what it means, really. Also, the morbid satisfaction of watching acts of cruelty comes from the Count or Marquis de Sade, a uh, French aristocrat and writer, notorious for the debauched way in which he lived and for the books he wrote. Three marks. <laughs> And now we come to the last round and go back to those quotations I gave the two teams earlier on the programme. Two marks and Scott James, can you give me the origin of your quotation? One volunteer is worth ten pressed men. Wellington? Yes. Dillis Powell, can I have the origin of your quotation? I come from haunts of Coot and Hearn. That was that brook which kept on making a sudden sally. That's it. Yes. By Tennyson. Well done. My wife and I made a sudden sound. That's <laughs> <laughs> the name of our daughter. Congratulations, <laughs> 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 you on the shortness of the labour. <laughs> Two marks it is. Tennyson's poem, The Brook. I come from haunts of Coot and Hearn. I make a sudden sally and sparkle out among the fern <laughs> to bicker down the valley. <laughs> this is the later stages of married life. <laughs> And now I shall ask Dennis and Frank to tell me their explanations of how these quotations came into being. And on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation receives the longer applause from the audience here in the theatre. So, back to Dennis Norton with his quotation, one volunteer is worth ten pressed men. Have you heard about this official called the Ombudsman? He's the person who's supposed to listen to all those complaints and grievances, and it's to him that I address my appeal tonight. Because he's got to put a lot of things right in the future. And I do ask him, I do make, want to make it plain to him that it's not economic equality or, or transport subsidies that are causing the breakdown of modern society. It's the smaller things. It's things like wrapped sugar cubes. I don't know if you see, in every restaurant now, they serve sugar as two little cubes wrapped in a packet. Now, Mr. Ombudsman, sir, 
there are those among us who take three little meals. <laughs> you see, th these are the things which are sending modern man round the twist. It's not the threat of war or the other things hanging over us. It's... It's floral toilet tissues. <laughs> you see, toilet tissues are a good idea in themselves. They are a thing designed specifically to throw away. You see? But now they are making a big point that they are floral. Can you help us work out why a thing becomes better for throwing away when it's got flowers on it? <laughs> I am asking you to turn your attention to these things because these are the things that are making us neurotic and insecure. Not the major issues, Mr. Ombudsman. Frozen butter pats. Every meal time, it's like trying to spread a plastic disc. <laughs> Help us, Mr. Ombudsman. They will ask you in the newspapers, the chaps will write and say, do something about the hydroelectric schemes. It isn't the hydroelectric schemes that are worrying us. Take no notice of the chaps in, in the newspapers. It is these things like floral toilet tissues and frozen butter pats that are making grown men break down and weep. And this is what you should take notice of, not the chaps in the newspapers. As the Duke of Wellington is reputed to have had it, and he is um, reputed to have had it, although actually it was, it was Napoleon who had it um, at Waterloo. <laughs> But as he said, a fallen tear is worth ten press men. <laughs> well, I'm almost in tears myself, so I'll pass on hastily to Frank Muir. And his quotation was, I come from haunts of Coote and Hearn. So there were the... Uh, you noticed as I came through the curtains, I don't know whether the studio audience here noticed that I, I was really just a little bit tiddly. <laughs> it, it, it passed off fairly quickly because as soon as I came in the building, the producer saw me and ordered immediately black coffee and a pair of socks. <laughs> <clears throat> the reason for this is that this morning, when I woke up, I swung my legs over the edge of the bed and sort of sat there, drooping slightly, and the telephone rang. And my wife swung her legs over and sat beside me and answered the phone, which was by the side of the bed, and I heard her chatting away, and I put my socks on. But actually, I didn't. Uh, what happened was, you see, that I was half asleep, still only half asleep by then, and I'd lolled slightly to the side and was resting against my wife on the bias, if you follow. <laughs> and when I leant down to put my socks on, I leant down vertically and actually put my socks on my wife. <laughs> While she was phoning. Uh, this is an important ingredient to explain what happened today. And my wife suddenly said, it's for you. And she handed me the phone. It was Father Kenny, the parish priest. And he said, it's the church bazaar. Now, I've penciled you down on the posters for opening it. I said, I'll... I'll ring you back early this evening. I'll, I'll find you a star. You don't me. Have a star to open. I promise to open your, your bazaar. And I passed the phone across and put it down. Who? Who to get? Who? Lightning struck. Mr. Pastry. <laughs> this marvellous comedian, marvellous with children. Mr. Pastry, Richard Hearn, just the man for him. I thought, I'll go and ask him. I know where he lives. I looked through the Christmas card lift. Sussex. <laughs> now, it's the, the day of the library trolley, so my wife had the car. So I got out the bicycle. <laughs> and, I, and I cycled to Sussex. 
Now, it's quite a long way from the poor end of Surrey, where we live, and it's a very cold day, and it gets the ankles, you know, if you're not used to cycling. And I looked down, and they were sort of red and mottled. The door was opened by a very nice old lady who introduced herself as Richard Hearn's aunt. And uh, she could see I was uh, rather shivering from the cycling, and she said, have a glass of my elderberry wine. And she got a tankard, you know, and I sloshed down this stuff, because it's only fruit juice after all, <laughs> this elderberry wine. And suddenly the room seemed to sort of turn and lurch slightly. I thought, these old cottages, you know, they do get a bit wobbly. <laughs> and I said, I want to ask whether Richard could open a fate. Suddenly she looked at my ankles and she said, you're wearing red socks. She said, we don't like communists here in this household. And I happen to know that my nephew, Mr. Hearn, doesn't either. I must ask you to leave. Outside, the cold air hit me. Something about the elderberry wine, it was awful. And I wondered, who, if Mr. Pastry, if Richard Hearn can do it, who, who could I get, who did I know? And suddenly I remembered Robert Coote. Now, Robert Coote... Is, is, a, is a big star. You know, he was the original uh, Pickering in, in uh, My Fair Lady, played at Broadway in London. So I rushed back home on my bicycle, got out the birthday card list, found Rob, uh, Robert Coote's address in Mayfair, went there. But this time my ankles had gone chill. They'd gone very cold indeed. The swelling had gone down, but they'd gone sort of mottled and blue. I went up in this lift in this lovely flat in Hill Street, and the door was opened by wonderful-looking woman. And she said, I am Robert's Aunt Sophia. Do come in. And she came in and said, Poor man, you look rather tired. I said, Yes, I am, rather. I want to ask whether Robert could open a fate for me, my, my local church bazaar. And she said, Yes, I should think so. Do have a martini. And she gave me this gin, and I drank the gin out of nerves. And she suddenly said, I'm sure Robert would be most interested... She said, Why are you wearing blue socks? <laughs> And I was in a bit of a dilemma here, you see. Should I tell her they were blue socks, or should I say that they were actually nude ankles, blue with the cold? So I have confessed, no, I said, well, actually, they are blue socks. She said, I'm afraid that isn't suitable at all, because blue is the colour of the Conservative Party in this country. And I happen to know that my nephew, Robert Coote, is appearing in a television play, playing the part of a Labour minister. I'm afraid it's most unsuitable now. I'm afraid we can't help you. Really, I went out, and the cold hit me again. I looked at the time. It was nearly time for the show tonight. I reeled into the studio, and there was Tony Shrine, the producer. He saw me. His face went livid. He said, how utterly dare you come in this inebriated condition? I said, it isn't like that at all, you see. And I leant casually against the wall. And happily, the wall was about five foot behind me. I missed it. <laughs> he helped me up by the armpits and popped me and said, What do you think you're doing? Come to a BBC recording in that state. And he suddenly saw my unclad ankles and shouted to his secretary, Fetch black coffee and a pair of socks. And he turned around to me and hissed it and said, Look at you. You haven't had time to dress. You have come from the boudoir of your fancy woman. <laughs> I looked at the man levelly, because that time I'd slumped to the floor. And, the line <laughs> level. and I looked up at him and said, I have not, if you must know, I come from the aunts of Coot and Hearn. <laughs> By your vote, and you don't help me at all, the contest of the two stories is an exact draw. The length of applause is exactly the same for both, but nevertheless, on their answers during the rest of the program, Frank Muir and Dillis win the whole contest by four marks, and that brings to an end this edition of My Word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir and Dennis Norton, 
introduced by Jack Longland. The program was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC. BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and those taking part are Dillis Powell, Frank Muir, Anne Scott James, and Dennis Norton. Here's round one to test their vocabulary. Two marks if they get the meaning of these words reasonably right. We begin with Dillis Powell. Dillis, what's the meaning of the word indigent? Indigent, indigent. means um, poverty-stricken, poor. Yeah. Poor, needy, lacking the necessities of life, two marks it is. Dennis Norton, the meaning of bally rag or bully rag? Bally rag is uh, it's sort of hijinks at Covent Garden. It's uh, <laughs> there are a lot of madcap tomboys around there. <laughs> um, bally rag. It's it's uh, it's kind of frivolity peculiar to ballet company. <laughs> I think you've got that. It means to maltreat by jeering or playing practical jokes oh. or hustling or horseplay or anything you like. Bally rag probably came first, and bully rag was. Making it more easily understandable, I suppose. And Scott James, what is a spurrier? Well, it's he's someone who rhymes with a furrier. Yes, spurious furrier. A spurious <laughs> furrier, yes. So, you know, rabbit as mink. <laughs> well, he's one of those useful people who makes that everyday commodity spurs. <laughs> <laughs> we all use so much in daily life. You're absolutely right. A spurrier is a man who makes spurs or a spur maker. Two marks. Frank Muir, yours is much harder. What is a staggard? Or it can be a staggart. It's a very good word. S T A double G A R D. S T A double G, isn't it? Not one G. No. Double G A R D. Staggard. Could be a boozy blackguard. <laughs> staggard? So one, one who staggers. <laughs> Had drunk his fill. Drunk his fill? Drunk his fill. What, the, uh, at Eve. <laughs> at Eve. At that's the uh, stag at bay. Yes. In rutting season. <laughs> a staggard is a blackguard stag <laughs> who has drunk his fill. <laughs> she is. Well, um, half a mark for accepting the clue. A staggard, and it's a fairly um, ancient word, is a stag which is four years old. Now, before we start round two, I give each team a quotation from them to write down, and I want the two women members of the team to go on studying their quotations, because at the end of the programme... I shall ask them where the quotations come from. And Dillis Power and Frank Muir, here's yours. The dawn comes up like thunder. And Anne Scott James and Dennis, yours is where there's a will, there's a way. And then at the end of the programme, I shall ask Frank and Dennis to give me their ideas of how these came to be said or written. Round two is legends and mythology. Two marks for correct answers. Dillis Power... What in Greek mythology, or who, if you prefer it, were the Erinyes? E R I N Y E S. Erinyes. They were the kind of um, disagreeable fates. Mm -hmm. What did they do? Oh well, they um, <coughs> they sort of hunted you down. Why? If you'd done wrong. Yes. <laughs> they hunted Orestes down. They did. They did very much, sir. Yes. These were the goddesses of vengeance, and they were hideous. And they avenged people who'd been done down, particularly those criminals who'd violated the laws of society or the natural law against filial duty or 
hospitality, committing murder or perjury and so on, and they pursued you even if it wasn't really your fault that you committed the crime. People like, as Lewis said, Orestes or Oedipus, who, Oedipus in particular, who had committed crimes without knowing what he was doing. But it was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Dennis Norden, we all know about the story of Androcles or Androclus and the lion, but in the end, what happened to Androcles and what became of the lion? That was very interesting, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Androcles met this lion in the forest and he took the thorn out of his foot. Yes. And the lion would soon be grateful. And then sometime later, Androcles was sent <coughs> excuse me, into this arena and this lion padded towards him and Androcles gave a great cry and said, you remember me? And the lion leapt and ate him. Because <laughs> it was an entirely different one. <laughs> um... It's a, it's a, it's a what happened to him <laughs> in the end? He ended up as a rug. <laughs> well, also, also, no. after the ending of your story, I'll give you a two marks. <laughs> this is the, the rather sick version you've given us. <laughs> yes. No, actually, the lion um, incredibly refused to destroy Andrew, please. Absolutely right. Two marks. Um, he was a slave, Andrew, please, and a tailor, I think. And he did meet this lion, was very sorry for himself indeed, and pulled out this... Um, thorn from his paw, and the lion was a great pal afterwards, and then when he met him in the arena, uh, Androcles was terribly frightened, and sank down on his knees and prayed, um, but the lion just came up and sniffed him and then embraced him, and the emperor who was watching this was so uh, astounded at what had happened that he set Androcles the slave free and gave him the lion for a pet. And Scott James, whose mother sent him dressed as a girl to the court of Lycomedes, and why did she do so? Achilles? Yes. Thetis's mother sent Achilles to get him out of the war, a very shabby thing to do. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Thetis was uh, Achilles' mother, and she tried very hard to make him immortal and been frustrated by her husband, and therefore she knew that he was likely to get killed through prophecy of his death in the Trojan War, <clears throat> and sent him away as a woman to the, the royal court in Skaros. But Odysseus was too smart and went there and discovered him by putting in front of him, the, all the women of the court, a lot of nice female jewellery on the one side and a sword and a shield on the other, and then caused a bugle to be blown off in the background as though a war was about to start and the silly Achilles in his woman's clothing, instead of picking up his jewellery, picked up the spear and the shield, and that discovered him. I bet they made him an officer as well. <laughs> <laughs> he showed OLQ, yes. <laughs> now, Frank, now, who was Asclepius... And how did he die? And how did he spell himself? Well, if you, um, <laughs> if you like, prefer to call him Esculapius. I wouldn't. Oh, mind. that's better. Ah, oh, yes. Uh, Esculapius. I don't know who the other one was, but Esculapius was the um, was the man who supplied the rollocks to Charon for rowing those people across that dreary old river Styx. <laughs> M medicine. Mm -hmm. Yes. Medicine. Yes. Ah, med. Oh, there we are. <laughs> <laughs> Two marks. <laughs> he's, he's the, he was, ah, uh, he gathered herbs and, and uh, medicine was, um, he was a kind of... Uh, I want to know how he died. His name seemed to connect with me with slow bicycle racing, but <laughs> it's a blind alley. No, I don't think so. Yeah. He was the Greek god of medicine, and his healing powers are so great that he got a bit above himself and began to raise men from the dead. And oh. Zeus, the chief of the gods, thought that he might teach mortals to be immortal, and this was obviously not to be allowed at all. And so he killed Asclepius with a thunderbolt, which was the weapon he used. That's the way he died. <coughs> On our round of origins and derivations, and three marks the maximum possible, if members of the team can define the present meaning and then give me the origin of these words or expressions or phrases. Dillis Powell again. Music hath charms. To soothe the savage air. It means... Um that uh, music is a great soother and um, yeah. tranquilizer. Yeah. And you don't need pep you don't need tranquilizing pills if you have it. And um, it comes from Congreve. Yes, uh, it means, as Dilly says, music can soothe and mollify you when you are in an angry or nasty mood. In Congreve's play, *The Morning Bride*, the opening lines are: "Music has charms to soothe a savage breast, to soften rocks." or bend a knotted oak. And the reference is, of course, to Orpheus, who could do all sorts of things like that with his magic lute, 
to Henry VIII, there's another song, Orpheus with his lute made trees and the mountain tops that freeze bow themselves when he did sing. Same idea. Dennis Norton, what is a Ouija board and why was it so called? O U I J A. Ouija or Ouija? Well, it's. it's um, I don't know. I, it's better when you're tight, I can tell you. <laughs> it seems to work better. It, you, you put. Uh, the letters of the alphabet round in a circle and you put an upended tumbler in the middle and then you all lay your forefingers on the tumbler and the tumbler moves to one of the letters and it's supposed to be people who have passed over to the other side but I'm not sure about it myself I think um, there's always somebody who pushes <laughs> um, and why call that we jar well, because they didn't used to do it with a tumbler. They used to do it with a wee jar. Push it. And then they couldn't sell it that way, so they gave it this rather kooky spelling. I, I think of an Indian mystic called wee jar. Wee jar yeah. I, I gave it the alternative pronunciation because it really does rather help. Oh, yes, yes. It mm, is, it's, a, it's known as a yes, yes. That's it. Spiritualists and others use this allegedly for receiving spirit messages. Um, usually you had a pointer of wood on wheels and that was on a board where the letters of the alphabet and one to other signs were printed and you put your finger on this and it moved or wheeled towards the letter which gave you the clue. It's a planchette. It's a planchette is the other word for it. Right. And the name comes from these two quite simple French and German words, we oui and ja, both of them meaning yes and the two put together make the we oui, ja board. Now, Anne Scott James, what is a melodrama and how did it get its name? Well, it's um, a sort of purple, purple passagey kind of play. Mm -hmm. What happens in it? Oh, it's tremendous murders and gore and uh, rather crude love, hate, etc. What happens at the end? What happens at the end? Mm. Virtue oh. triumphs. Yes. Yeah. The curtain right. comes down. That's right. That's it. That's what I wanted. Um, that's what it is now. How do you get its name? Milos. Yeah. Milos. In fact, bridge music is in, yes. in a play is still known as the Milos. Yeah. You haven't quite got that, but you very nearly have. As Anne rightly says, it nowadays means a thoroughly sensational play in, in which people <coughs> tend to overact, and it ends always with virtue triumphant and the villain foiled or dead. But originally, it meant what it says. It is, it's a play and music put together. Song and music were introduced and an orchestra and made a background to the words. And at that stage, it didn't mean one of these uh, sensational dramas at all. But um, various composers, including Beethoven and Mendelssohn, did, in fact, write melodramas in the old sense of the word. Frank Muir, what is a maroon, the one associated with bangers, and why is it so called a maroon? Well, it, you know, it, it uh, is let off as large firework to warn ships at sea or something in fog. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and uh, it's called a maroon. Well, you can't call it a toffee apple or <laughs> a tram car. It's a maroon. It's, uh, it's, it's his name. Uh, had a reason for being called that. <laughs> Put it into French. Chestnut. <laughs> yes, now explain. Well, it's... Uh, um, <laughs> Oh. If you get a whole lot of chestnuts yes. and put some gunpowder at the bottom and stuff <laughs> them all into a, into an old firework case and light it. Simpler than that. No, it, the chestnuts get it hot explodes. and they yes. explode. They explode, yes. And you're, what are you doing with a chestnut when it does that? Roasting it. Yes, roasting yes. it. Roast chestnut blows up. <laughs> You've crept home. Um, Damn silly uh, reason for calling <laughs> it. <laughs> uh, two, I think, because I did oh. give quite a lot of help. It's a firework which explodes with a very loud bang, as Frank says, usually as a warning, or it could be at the start of a fiesta or something of that kind. And it does simply come from the French word maron, meaning a chestnut. And if you roast chestnuts in a particular way, they sometimes pop and explode. And that's why it was called this. Next round is the who, why, and what department. Two marks for correct answers. Let us spell who described what? as a hateful tax levied upon commodities. Hmm. A hateful tax. You ask your partner. Tea. 
Not no. tea. Who did it? Um, what was it? It yes. wasn't tea. It wasn't tea. 18th century. Yes. Probably imposed by Walpole. Uh, I think it probably was. Oh. But it probably doesn't help us, that's what you mean. It doesn't help very much, yes. Yeah. The comment was made a little later than that. It was you? made by Dr. Johnson. Quite right. And it's his definition of excise duty, a hateful tax levied upon commodities, and a jolly good definition, too. <laughs> now, Dennis Norton, who said in what work, it isn't etiquette to cut anyone you've been introduced to, remove the joint. <laughs> I don't know, do you know? It must be Alice, mustn't yes. it? Yes, yeah. Is Ooh. it one of the queens? Queens, yes, it must right. be, yes. Mm. In well, which one? be through the looking glass. Yes, quite right. Um, I think that's good enough, too. It's the Red Queen to Alice in Through the Looking Glass by Lewis Carroll. It isn't etiquette to cut anyone you've been introduced to, remove the joint, and a little later with an execrable pun, she says, undishcover the fish or dishcover the riddle. It goes on like that for quite a long time. Two marks. <coughs> And Scott James, who in what book by whom said three things I never lends, my oss, my wife, and my name? Oh, Jar yes, Jar yes. Jar yes. Author? Assertees. Yes, two marks. Uh, Mr. Jorrocks in Hillingdon Hall by R.S. Assertees was being asked by a lady to lend her his horse. And these were the three things he never lent, his oss, his wife, and his name. Frank Muir... Who said in what connection, give me but one firm spot on which to stand and I will move the earth? Um, it was Ar Archimedes. Quite right. And, and what was, was he referring to? He was referring to the, um, uh, the effect a fulcrum can have. Yeah. If you can get far, far enough away with yeah. your lever from the levering point yeah. and somewhere firm to stand but enough room to jump up and down, you yeah. can, in theory, move the earth. Absolutely right. Well, he later invented the screw for raising water, which seems a bit obscure, but there we are. Archimedes' is a screw, yes, that's mm. right. Um, two marks, it's Archimedes, and it's his theory of the lever and the fulcrum, and as um, Frank says, theoretically, if you get far enough away and the lever is long enough and the fulcrum's in the right place, you can shift the earth. This was his discovery. And now we come to the last round and go back to those two quotations I gave the teams earlier in the programme. Two marks to Miss Powell. Can you give me the origin of your quotation? The dawn comes up like thunder. It's Kipling. Mm -hmm. Rudyard Kipling, The Road to Mandalay. Two marks, well done. And Scott James, the origin of your quotation, please, which was, where there's a will, there's a way. I think it's anonymous, one of those fine old English proverbs. It is a proverb, <laughs> but it's quoted by George Her Herbert in outlandish proverbs in the 17th century. Where there's a will, there's a way. And now I shall ask Frank and Dennis to give me their explanations of how these quotations came into being. And on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation receives the longer applause from the audience here in the theatre. So back to Frank Muir. The dawn comes up like thunder. I'll make you wait a bit, I think. <laughs> I don't need the two points. Don't need the money. You see, um, I've got this pop group... You see, I've, I've, um, I've signed them up. They're signed up to me. And uh, everything's going swimmingly now. And we're going to be in the money. I, I'm, I'm going to be uh, a millionaire. When I say it's a pop group, it's actually five rather elderly ladies. <laughs> um, <laughs> you see, I, I've just been uh, concerned with a television show. In this show, there are five middle-aged, charming ladies who are the music for the show, and they, they, they are a quintet, string quintet, violin, cello, and that bit. And um, when they left, I said, um, would you like to come under my banner? <laughs> I hadn't got a banner, you know, but it sounded a thing to say. Uh, would you like me to manage you? So I, I signed them up to see for this contract. They get 12 pounds a week and a pork pie. <laughs> um, I realized afterwards I really hadn't got all that much of a bargain anyway because all their instruments had warped. You see, part of this was due to the effect of the, of the BBC um, cameraman's breath. You see, because they always have a couple of gins before the show, and, and they used to help the ladies with their instruments, and their breath blistered the varnish, you see. <laughs> and, and also, they had nothing to wear. They only had their own clothes. These lovely clothes they had were supplied by the BBC on the show. I didn't know all this, and I didn't know what to do about it. I thought I must invest. You know, you've got to 
uh, to accumulate, you've got to expectorate. So I, I watched <laughs> advertisements very carefully, uh, all these little mail order advertisements. They advertised a complete set of string instruments, five. I wrote off for those. And they had um, a set of continental ornamental combs. I thought, lovely, Spanish, you know, halfway there, half a gram each, sent off my PO, box number, you know. And they even sent off an amplifier so that Miss Cloyes herself could sing if necessary and everybody could hear clearly. Then, unfortunately, the stuff all came in and it really wasn't quite what I expected. <laughs> You see, the five-stringed instruments were actually Irish harps. <laughs> so I had my five ladies with five Irish harps. My amplifier it turned out not to be an ordinary microphone, but to be an amplifier for guitars, to be plugged into electric guitars. And worst of all, my ornamental continental combs were ornamental continental comms. <laughs> There was, of course, no way of telling from the spelling. So they were Albanian comms, <laughs> used worn and festival occasions by the peasantry and in a vile state of repair. <laughs> they were all torn and rent. Well, now, was I, was I to give up or was I to press on? It's a question of ingenuity coming to the fore. I told my four ladies, to, five ladies, to climb in to these wretched comes, torn though they were. I said, that's your gimmick. All this sort of quasi-military gear they're wearing now. You're all like that, and that's what I'll call you. The torn combinations. <laughs> TC. Then I will wire up your soft Irish harps into the amplifier to make an electronic sound. So any of you want a, a great pop group for your village hall or for your function, Use mine. You want a big sound, Everyone's, everybody wants a big elemental sound. Well, they'll give it to you. The torn comes harp like thunder. <laughs> And now we go on to Dennis Norton, and if you remember, his quotation was, where there's a will, there's a way. When it became apparent that the only career open to me was the entertainment profession, and there I'm quoting my Latin master's exact word, <laughs> I went along to a big cinema in Leicester Square, and I said to the manager, look, I want a job here, I'm prepared to do anything, I don't care how humble the capacity, anything you have to offer, I'll do the job. And he was so impressed that he gave me a job as ice cream girl. <laughs> I, I didn't last at it very long, for health reasons. I, I'm a rather tall bloke and, and the, the strap that goes around your shoulder on the thing was uh, rather short so that the tray came so high up on my chest I kept getting the straws from the orange drink <laughs> up my nose and I could very well have developed a nasty condition <laughs> but I explained this to him and he moved me on to being the chap in charge of the cinema sign that is to say I had to put up those large cut out letters which tell you the name of the film that's playing at the time. And I used to stand outside and watch the people passing and think, if it wasn't for me, they wouldn't know the name of the film that's on at this cinema. <laughs> Actually, in the beginning, they didn't know the name of the film that was on at the cinema because those letters are awfully big, you know, they're about four foot high and you have to hump them up this ladder in a high wind. And sometimes you get them in the wrong order, you know. I remember there was Sean Connery in Glodfinger. <laughs> uh, um, but the worst mistake, actually, was not my fault at all. I was, I was actually home in bed, and I got this call at three o'clock in the morning from the manager, and he said, your Y has dropped off. <laughs> we were showing My Fair Lady at the time, and I realised that the Y, well, you know, I immediately rushed out of bed, as who wouldn't, because, however permissive the 
moral climate that we are enjoying at the moment, it is just not on to give the impression that you're showing a film called My Fair Lad. <laughs> and I got there about four o'clock in the morning. Sure enough, there was this large letter Y shattered on the pavement. I had to replace it. And then I had an inspiration. At the cinema opposite, they were showing the film Moby Dick. Moby, you see? M-O-B-Y. <laughs> well, it was the work of a moment. You know, nobody about that time in the morning. Slip over there, shin up the sign, grab the letter Y, and come back, which I accomplished without any... Well, there was one nasty moment, actually, when a policeman noticed me carrying it. Uh, he said, excuse me, sir, may I ask what you're doing carrying that large letter Y with you this time of the morning? And I said, it isn't a letter Y, officer. I thought very quickly. I said, I'm a water diviner by profession. <laughs> and I happen to use a very large twig. <laughs> well, it satisfied him. And in no time, I had that letter back up there. And sure enough, next day, our cinema was showing My Fair Lady on its sign. Mind you, the cinema opposite looked a bit weird, showing a film called Mob Dick, but <laughs> that's show business. And ever since, I've had a rather warm feeling for Herman Melville's novel. And in fact, I would remind any sign putter-uppers who may be listening that if they're ever in the same trouble, remember my predicament, remember Moby Dick, remember that where there's a whale, there's a why. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't see how Dennis was going to fight his way out of that one, but he did. And by your vote, nevertheless, Frank Muir wins the contest of the two stories. And that brings us to a final score in which Anne Scott James and Dennis win the entire contest by two marks. And that also brings to an end this edition of My Word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir, and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The program was devised by Tony Schreien and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC. BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and those taking part are Anne Scott James, Dillis Powell, Dennis Norden, and Frank Muir. Round one tries to test their vocabulary. Two marks if they get the meaning of these words roughly right. Anne Scott James, what is a compotator? C O M P O T A T O R, compotator. Um, the pot part means drinker. Yes. Is it somebody who drinks with other people? Yes, absolutely right. Two marks it is. A boon companion or fellow tippler, drinking chum. Two marks. Frank Muir, what is an OPA? O P A H. OPA. Opa. <laughs> Omar Khayyam's father. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
There's a short, very short version of the title of the song, Oh My Beloved Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Opa. Wrong continent so far. Oh, it's the... <clears throat> oh, it's, it's the Far East. No. No, South Africa. It's West Africa. Yes, it is. It's, 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 like, it's a semi-precious... Go on. <laughs> <laughs> no? <laughs> <laughs> I'll it's give you so half a mark for a wonderful guess of West Africa. <laughs> It's a rare, brilliantly coloured, <coughs> large North Atlantic fish of the mackerel family, you know, known also as the kingfish or the moonfish, and it is an African, a West African name. Don't Boy. care. No. <laughs> Never knew. Now, dear Liz what is the meaning of the word prurient? Prurient? Prurient. 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 You are. I -E -N -T. Well, that means prurient. Dirty, dirty old man. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, um, the, the thoughts of a dirty old man. Yes, that's more like it. Dirty old thoughts. It Dirty means. old thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> Given to indulgence in lewd or lascivious thoughts and ideas, prurient two marks. Mm. Dennis Norton, what is, and I pronounce this very carefully, what is formication? F O R M I C A T I O N. <laughs> formication. Phew. And you couldn't well. have a better definition of prurient than the last of <laughs> Um, formic acid is something yes. to do with ants, yeah. so this is something to do with ants. Mm -hmm. Formication is, is, um, ant, the gathering of ants. All right, uh, formication is a sensation as of ants crawling all over your skin. And Scott James, what is a brill, B-R-I-L-L? -L? Oh, it's another fish. Yes, what kind of fish? A sea fish. Mm -hmm. Well, just so. A sea fish, Jack. Round or flat? <coughs> it's a flat sea fish. <laughs> well done. <laughs> well done, Anne. It's a flat fish looking rather like, and I think related to, the turbot. Only by marriage. <laughs> <laughs> Frank Muir, what is the meaning of penniform? P-E-N-N-I-F-O-R-M. Penniform. I'm still worried about D-O-T, <laughs> dirty old thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> because a French, when a French bride comes to the altar, she carries with her what is called in French D.O.T., which yes. is her dowry. Yeah. But does it really stand for she comes to her husband with her dirty old thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm so sorry, I'm but interrupting. What is, this, but what, what, what is it? What's the word? Uh, the meaning of the word penniform. P-E-N-N-I-F-O-R-M. Penniform. Penniform? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Penniform. <laughs> you know if you go down a public convenience... <laughs> Four of the doors have little machines on them, and one is marked free, ask attendant. <laughs> when you speak to the attendant, he then gives you a form to fill in. <laughs> That's a penny form. Wing shape. Something to do with wing. Yes. Wing. Feather. Yes. It's, penny it's having the form or appearance of a feather. Dillis Powell. What is nihility? N i h i l i t y. Nihility. Nothingness. Yes, <laughs> absolutely right. Nothingness, non-existence, or it can mean a mere trifle, the merest trifle. Two marks. And Dennis Norton, what is a bolide? B o l i d e. Bolide. Never in a long and checkered <laughs> life <laughs> have I ever come in contact with. It sounds like some kind of traffic accident where you. <laughs> Collide with a bollard. Or, <laughs> it or could very be. Is it anything to do with the bowl of a tree? No, it? it'd be very unfortunate mm. to collide with this. No, Jack. I, no, no, I, I cannot well, disguise the fact that I don't. It's something to do with throwing, is it? Mm. Yeah, because. Um, bolus. Yes, uh, yeah, that's right. The bolus, yeah. which is a bit of string with a kind of. Is ball it something at the end. like a boomerang? Would that be a type of a bolide? No, uh, I'll give you half a mark something for knowing it, knowing it was something like a missile. It is a large meteor, particularly the explosive kind, which they call a fireball, but the, of course the great Greeks used to think there was a chapel through them, so that is why it's called bolide, comes from a Greek root meaning throwing something. Well, before we start round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down, and then I hope the two women members of the team will go on studying their quotations till the end of the programme, because I shall ask them where the quotations come from then. Anne Scott James and Dennis Norton, your quotation is, it's a great day for the Irish, and Dennis Powell and Frank Noir, yours is, mad, bad, and dangerous to know. 
And then at the end of the program, I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their idea of how these came to be said or written. Round two is about myths and legends, three marks for correct answers. And Scott James, what legendary hero of the Greeks carried off the sister of the Queen of the Amazons and gave her a son, hunted the Caledonian boar, and even abducted young Helen of Sparta, later on married Phaedra to name but a few of his adventures, and who killed him by treacherously <coughs> throwing him over a cliff? That was right Theseus. Yes. <laughs> Theseus. Theseus was the man. Um, something to do with Hippolyta, wasn't it? Yes. Um, it was not Hippolyta herself, though. No. It was no. her um, sister-in-law. I know. Get him. <laughs> there must have been a man. No woman could have thrown Theseus no, no over a cliff. Could do that. No. no, I think no. the second half is pretty hard. Um, Theseus was killed by King Lycomedes of Scaros, who crept up on him behind when he was standing on a rock in, over the sea and pushed him over. And uh, <laughs> it was Antiope, uh, who was the sister of Hippolyta, according to Greek legend, that Theseus married and had a son by. Um, Shakespeare makes, in Midsummer Night's Dream, makes Theseus betrothed to Hippolyta, not to Antiope. Two marks. Frank Muir, who was Thor, and what was he the god of? And what were his three extra special possessions? Thor was the god of Thunburn. <laughs> uh, Thor was the god of thunder. Yes. And of Thursday. Yes. <laughs> and um, if I had, he had a hammer. <laughs> Thunderbolt yes. hammer. Yes. Oh, yes, that's right. He threw it, Jack. Yes. He was the Scandinavian god of war and of thunder, and Thursday is named after him. He was son of the chief god Woden. But he had this throwing hammer, which came back itself to him every time he threw it, which was very useful. He didn't have to go and fetch it. He had a belt, which doubled his strength and power, and iron gloves, very necessary indeed, for throwing this thunderbolt hammer. Now, Delispa, who was Freya, or Freya? Well, she was a, a Scandinavian goddess. Yes. Of spring. <laughs> no, uh, not spring. Not as Youth. Youth. Who'd you yeah. marry? Oh, dear, there was something about... No um, scandal. <laughs> <laughs> earth can she have married? She didn't marry Thor. Well, that little chap, she married was it, was a... Thor married a girl called Sip. Oh, does that wouldn't help him. Didn't help him much. Didn't she marry <laughs> one, wasn't she made to marry one of those giants? No, one out of three. <laughs> uh, Scandinavian mythology, she was the wife of Odin, a warden, oh, the chief oh. god, but he deserted her because she loved her beautiful clothes and finery better than she loved him. But she was nevertheless the most beautiful of the goddesses, and she was the goddess of love and of the dead, and she presided over ma marriages, so she must have a very busy time. She was a sort of cross between yeah. Venus and Juno. Friday named after her. Freya, one mark. <coughs> Dennis Norton, there was a certain Greek who got drowned in the sea at a certain place when he was swimming to see his lady love, and she threw herself into the same stretch of water and was drowned. Who were the two lovers, and what famous British poet accomplished the feat of swimming across this stretch of water at a later date. It was Leanne. No, yeah. they had these were the two that had right. their names the wrong way round. Leander was the chap yes. who swam across the Hellespont yes. to Hero, to his mm -hmm. girlfriend Hero, at some considerable distance. He wasn't much use when he got there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Lord Byron. Yes. Emulated it, accompanied, if I remember, by an army officer. Well done. I wish I could give you a bonus mark. Three marks anyway, jolly it's good. A different thing entirely. Uh, Leander sw swam across from Abydos to Lesbos to see Hera, who lived in a <coughs> tower. And she put a, a light out at night, and he got drowned in the end because the, the light got blown out, and he didn't manage to get there. But Byron did it in 1810. He wrote some rather doggerish lines about it in Don Juan. A better swimmer you could scarce see ever, he could perhaps have passed the Hellespont, as once a feat on which ourselves we prided, Leander, Mr. Eakenhead, and I did. It was <laughs> Lieutenant Eakenhead who also was on this <coughs> swim. Well, now we have a round of origins and derivations. Three marks if members of the team can give the present meaning and then give me the origin of these words or expressions or phrases. And Scott James. The oaks. The present meaning, it's a race. Yes. A uh, horse race. Where? What did you say? Where? Ah, at Epsom. Yes. 
in the same week as the Derby. That's it. Yeah. <coughs> or Derby. Who the invented name. the race? Was it Horses. his um, his emblem or heraldic thing or something no, rather? That, no, 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 that would mislead you. Some, but if hmm? you can give me the name of the chap who, who invented first the started oaks. the race. Lord Acorn. <laughs> yes, <laughs> well done. <laughs> something tells me I'm stuck. Hmm. The Oaks is one of the horse racing classics. It takes place on the Friday after the Derby. It's for three-year-old fillies and is run at Epsom. And it was called the Oaks by the 12th Earl of Derby in 1779, named after a bit of property that he had near Epsom called the Oaks. And it was the same Earl of Derby who also invented the Derby itself. Frank Muir, yes. to sport one's oak. Yes, it means uh, uh, to pretend you're not at home. Yes. You, you're not open to callers. Mm -hmm. And it's a university thing from the ancient universities. And it means they have uh, that you shut an oak door. Okay. There's one door which, is, which you don't uh, necessarily shut. I mean, you shut, but it, it doesn't mean you're out. It's sort of a, just a door to keep the drafts out. <laughs> and there's a big, thick oak one. Actually, <laughs> the, all houses had this, but uh, to sport your oak meant you closed the big oak one. That meant that you mustn't be interrupted. Absolutely right, three marks. It's the older universities, and the sets of rooms have these two doors that Frank's described, the outer one usually being this very strong one made of oak, and either meant you weren't there, or you, you wanted people to think you weren't there because you were working, or possibly had a girlfriend, or, or something, anyway. You didn't want them to come in. Three marks. Dillis Powell, a Ruritanian. Ruritanian means kind of imaginary, belonging to an imaginary romantic country nowadays, and it was an invention of Anthony Hope Hawkins yes. in novels like Rupert of Hensel. Yes, yes. That's right. good enough. Three marks it is. Uh, it can be applied to a real state if it's uh, sufficiently small and remote and romantic and full of court romances and intrigues. Um, but this mm. is the kind of country about which Anthony Hope wrote both in The Prisoner of Zender and in Rupert of Hensel, and uh, it was set in very much middle last century um, yeah. European kingdoms. Now, Dennis Norton, the rub of the green, or a rub of the green. A rub of the green? It's something to do with winter green. <laughs> <laughs> a rub of the green? How would you... Well, it's some game, obviously. Yeah. It? It's a game which has green... Well... Golf. What's it Golf. mean? Golf. It means... Well, what it means, I haven't the faintest... Well, how would you say it? I've never heard anybody <laughs> say, have a rub of the green. <laughs> <laughs> it's a non-phrase. That's, no. that's a rub of the green. That's a rub of the green, you'd say. By golly, that's a rub of the green. Oh, <laughs> that's the luck. That's the way it goes. Yes. Right? That's yes. the way it goes, yes. yes. Well, All right, well, rub of the green does mean the luck of the game, something you can't help and you have to accept because there's nothing much you can do about it. And it originates in golf, and technically I think it means in the rules of the game, accidental interference with the course or the position of the golf ball. But it probably comes originally from the way in which you mowed a green in the game of golf. And when you do mow, the blades of grass lean over in one direction after the mower has been over them. So when you're putting, you're either putting with the lie of the land and the glass blades or against it. And that originally was what rubber the green meant. And now we come to the last round and go back to those quotations I gave the teams early in the programme. <coughs> There's two marks and Scott James. Can you give me the origin of your quotation? It's a great day for the Irish. I think it was a song. Yes. Sung by Judy Garland. It is a song. Uh, <laughs> sung by Judy Garland. It comes from a film, I think, called Little Nelly Kelly. Well, now, Dillis Power, can you give me the origin of your quotation? Mad, bad, and dangerous to know. Well, that's um, all mixed up with Byron, isn't it? Yes. Byron and Lady Caroline Lamb. Yes, it's Lady Caroline Lamb writing about Byron, who is at that stage something of a friend of hers, and writing in her journal. Two marks. And now I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their explanation of how these quotations came into being. And on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever impossible explanation receives the longer applause from the audience here in the theatre. So, back to Dennis Norden and his quotation, it's a great day for the Irish. On this programme, 
and Scott James and I have sat together for three years. I don't mean, you know, we sat for three years solidly, you know. I, I mean, once a week, you know, because on the intervening six days, we sometimes get up and walk around a bit. You know. <laughs> but when a man and a woman have been in this enforced proximity for this amount of time, something happens. <laughs> Barriers broken down. And last week, Anne turned and nudged me. This is while the other two were chuntering on about something or other. <laughs> and she looked me in the face, which she can do because she's the same height as I am, except when wearing flatties, which I don't wear all that often. <laughs> And she murmured, you have bald eyes. And I murmured, I have gypsy blood. <laughs> and she said, I didn't say bold eyes. I said bald eyes. <laughs> Your eyes have no lashes. <laughs> Why? And I told her. I knew I had time because it was during one of these rounds of Greek mythology and... Jack was giving the full answer, you see. I knew I had a good eight minutes. You see, I wear glasses. And glasses are very inefficient instruments, actually. They don't function in, under all the circumstances. I have to say under again. Under which you might need them, you see. For example, they, they steam up. If, if you come out of a cold atmosphere into a warm atmosphere they steam up if i go to see a french film by the time i've got in the cinema and rubbed the steam off my glasses the girl's generally got her clothes back on again <laughs> but much worse than that is rain if you go walking in the rain and you're wearing glasses by the time you've taken about 10 paces it's like trying to Peer through Niagara Falls. It's all running down, you know. And this annoyed me, and I hit on what I thought, and I still think, is a very good invention. Windscreen wipers. <laughs> very, very tiny windscreen wipers. And I worked it out, and I went round to this chap I know, who's a mechanic, and I gave him a spare pair of glasses and I said, I want you to fit wiper blades on these that go backwards and forwards. I didn't tell him why, you see, in case he'd pinch the idea. <laughs> and so <clears throat> he did with a little motor. You know, they make motors, transistorized motors, terribly tiny now. And he put this little motor on the hinge where the earpiece goes. It's so tiny, it actually works off the electricity in my body. It's rather amusing where I had to plug it in, actually. And, um, then he rang up and told me they were finished. And the first rainy day, I went round there, and I put them on, and I walked out into the rain, and after about five paces, with a triumphant smile, I switched on the motor. That is why my eyes have no lashes. <laughs> the idiot had put the blades on the inside of the lenses. It was a kind of shearing sound. But I still think it's a very good invention. I do commend it to anybody else who may care to take it up. With this one proviso, just make sure that they do put the blades on the outside of the lenses. Otherwise, of course, as this song goes, it's a grave day for the eyelash. <laughs> Now, that must be very interesting to watch, your head going side to side like Wimbledon, I think. And now we go back to Frank Muir's quotation, mad, bad, and dangerous to know. Ah, yes, well, I used to say this uh, many years ago when I was a young lad. I used to say it 
uh, about Maudie Butterwick. Um, I was 14 and a half at the time, and my nickname changed from Flossie to Nora, <laughs> uh, which is really tied up with the story. I'd been called Flossie when I was very young due to an addiction to candy floss. <laughs> but whether it was due to the candy floss or what, but my teeth started to splay out. I had very, very protruding teeth in those days, and uh, the legend had it that I could eat an apple through a tennis racket. <laughs> which is why I got the name of Nora. <laughs> now I had, um, at that time, a brace put on my teeth. You know, one of those little sort of plate things and a, a gold-coloured uh, wire which went around the front of the teeth and it had two little screws which were tightened um, quarter turn every other day and gradually, squealing, the teeth were dragged back into the skull <laughs> over, over a period of years. I was then 14 and a half, and something curious happened to me between the ages of 14 and 14 and a half. When I was 14, I was about 5 foot 1 and pudgy. And when I was 14 and a half, I was 6 foot 3. <laughs> it was as though there was an old remains of a tube of toothpaste had been squeezed and suddenly shut up. I was sort of less in girth, but almost twice the height. And for some curious reason, which was a surprise to me at the time, I wasn't very good with the girls. But I, I, and I, I was very puzzled by this, and also rather desperate, because I was madly in love with uh, Maudie Butterwick. You see, he was a rather super girl, a rather dolly girl. Uh, she was very short. She was about four foot nine and rather dumpy, I suppose one would call her. Dark hair and pouting lips. And Maudie used to, was much given to leaning against walls and say, I'm bored. And I couldn't think of an answer, mainly because I didn't know what bored meant. It wasn't a word that had crossed my path at 14 and a half. I thought it meant I'm Belgian or something. You know. <laughs> and um, I was very puzzled quite how to go about Maudie Butterwick. And then suddenly the, I was given a book to read. I was very interested at the time in Lepidoptera and anything with butterflies and moss. And this fellow at school, um, who'd apparently got laryngitis because he whispered to me, would I like to read this book, you see. And I thought it was Lady Chatterley's Lava, you see, so... Uh, <coughs> so I was very keen on, on reading it, and I was, I was uh, on the tram going home from school one day, on the step of the tram, hanging, and I suddenly remembered this book, and I got it out, and I started reading it. And uh, it wasn't about uh, Lava at all, it was about this gamekeeper and this, this lady in the, in the wood, and... Uh, he was, he was chewing her ear. And I was absolutely fascinated because he chewed her ear and this lady, Lady Chatley, she sort of moaned and lit up like an electric light bulb. <laughs> and I realised that the, the, the way to Maudie Butterwick's heart was to, <laughs> was, was to gnaw her ear, you see. Uh, fortunately, I didn't read any more because I started to read the next page and fell off the tram. <laughs> and and I, I couldn't find the book. I don't know what happened to it. But I, I lurked near Maudie Butterwick for another two or three weeks while she leant against the wall and said, I'm bored. And then I said, wondering how to g go about this, I suddenly said, I've got something I want to whisper to you. And I, I chewed away at her ear. <laughs> now, Maudie Butterwick was much addicted to complicated earrings. <laughs> and she had a, a, a brass earring with some complicated pattern. And in some way, this became fast lodged with the brace over my teeth. <laughs> and I couldn't separate from Maudie Butterwick. And there we were, lodged <laughs> in the high street at Broadstairs, in the wall next to the baker shop. This was terrible. I tried and wriggled. And she said, get me free. And I said, I'm trying, Miss Butterwick. And I, I, I tried to get the, the brace thing off, and it wouldn't come off. We were jammed. I said, we'll have to walk to Margate Hospital. <laughs> it's about three and three-quarter miles where we were separated by a surgeon, a skilled surgeon. It was really a very disastrous experience, and um, that's why I've always said... I, I never spoke to her again, never. And very often, lads of my own age, the following year or two, would see Miss Butterwick leaning up against the wall next to the baker's shop and say, who is she? What is she? What, 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 tell me about her. And that's when I'd say, I know who she is. 
She's moored, bored, and dangerous to gnaw. <laughs> I do like Frank Muir in the role of Lord Byron. I think it's perfectly splendid. And by your vote, he wins the contest of the two stories. But on the other hand, because of their superior performance during the rest of the programme, Anne Scott James and Dennis Norden win the entire contest by one and a half marks. That also brings to an end this edition of My Word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The program was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC. BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and this programme comes to you from the Commonwealth Institute, London. And those taking part are Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir, and Dennis Norton. We go straight into round one to try and test the vocabulary of the members of the teams. Two marks if they get the meanings of these words right. Beginning with Dillis Powell, it's rather a difficult one, I think, Dillis. What is a frontistory? Something to do with wisdom. Something to do with wisdom, wisdom. it is, yes. Is it? Yes. yes. Oh. Um, something to do with wisdom. Um, it's a place where you have wisdom, or... Yes. It's a sort uh, of thinking place. It's a place for thinking in, a, a sort of thinkery. And uh, it was, first of all, used uh, in a sarcastic way about the school of Socrates in Athens by people who didn't love Socrates very much. Dennis Norton, what is carphology? Uh, ology is the, is the study of. Yes. Carphology. <coughs> well, <laughs> if, it, if it was thiology, it would be the study of miniskirts, I guess. <laughs> I think carphology is an earlier Edwardian. <laughs> I, it's a word I very rarely use. <laughs> Never mind, Dennis. All it shows is that you're an exceptionally healthy person because carphology is delirious fumbling with the bedclothes. As a... <laughs> As I hasten to add, in influenza. Um, Anne Scott James, what is ferriage? Oh, I should think it's a, something to do with carrying, a carrying charge. Yes, for what? What do you mean, coal? Well, what are you on that you have to be carried and you have a to ferry? Pay? All right, fair enough. <laughs> I think you <laughs> held out on me there, Anne. Uh, ferriage is conveyance by or the charge for using a ferry across a river or what have you. Two marks, well done. Frank Muir, what is or are the bots? The bots. B O T T S. <laughs> it's a disease of. Um, it's either a sheep or a horse. Yes. Uh, the bots, a disease in horses caused by a parasitic worm, which is in itself <laughs> the bot, if you want to know. Well, before we begin round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down. And the two women members of the team will, I hope, go on studying those quotations because at the end of the programme I shall ask them where the quotations come from. 
And Dillis Powell and Frank Muir, here's your quotation, there's a long, long trail, a winding. And Scott James and Dennis, your quotation is, was this the face which launched a thousand ships? <coughs> and then at the end of the programme, I shall ask Frank and Dennis to give me their idea of how these came to be said or written. Round two is legend and mythology and three marks for right answers. Dennis Power, in Greek mythology, who was Ate? A-T-E, A-T-E. She was a goddess. Yes. Of um, something rather disagreeable. Yes. Discord. No. So, hate. Was, uh, uh, not discord, that was another one. Oh. Um, death? No. Um, one out of three that knowing she was a Greek goddess. She's one of the daughters of Zeus. Uh, she personifies infatuation or criminal folly which leads both gods and men astray. Uh, sometimes later she was thought of as the avenger of sin, which is a bit unfair because normally she provoked you into sin. They throw her out of heaven because she trapped Zeus into making a rash oath, and she now walks lightly over men's heads, never touching the ground. <laughs> <laughs> now, Dennis Norton, when Jason stole the golden fleece with the help of Medea, whom he promised to make his wife, both of them fled hurriedly from the king of Colchis, who chased after them. How did Medea <laughs> delay this pursuit by the king? I don't think I even understood the question. <laughs> <laughs> They'd got away with the loot. They got away with the loot, yeah. And they were going to marry with luck a bit later, and they were being chased by the chap to whom the golden fleece belonged, oh, who was... Yeah. The and king. How, and how did they get away? <laughs> how, did they, how did they delay it? <laughs> she cast some kind of a yes. spell. Go, she cast go, something, go. but not a spell. She cast, um... she cast a lot of very unpleasant bits and pieces. The did flesh she? of something or other. Mm -hmm. Oh. Whatever it is, it's bound to be distasteful. She tore up a dog, poisoned its flesh, yeah. threw it behind, and they ate it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, half a, <laughs> half a mark for way. getting a bit of it. Uh, she took with her, she wasn't a very nice character, my dear, she took her young brother, Absurtus, with her, with her, and she killed him and cut him up into small pieces and cast these bits, bit by bit, into the sea. And the king, who was a pious character, picked them up piece by piece because he wanted to make a rather nice corpse of it at the end, and they got away. Mm. Not a very nice legend. That's your brother all over. <laughs> 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 All right, Anne Scott James. Who is Laomedon? Mm, something in Homer, I, someone yes? in Homer, I think. Yes. Well, he was a Trojan warrior. Yes, rather early. He was the founder of Troy. Yes. He was king of Troy, and he was father of the king in the uh, actual Trojan War of Homer, of Priam, and Hesione. And um, he had a couple of gods working for him on the job of building Troy, Apollo and Poseidon, Poseidon built the walls of Troy, and Apollo looked after his herds uh, so that the building could go a bit faster. And when they'd finished the job, Laomedon the king refused to pay them. And so Poseidon sent a sea monster to ravage the whole country. And to appease him, they had to sacrifice a maiden, as they usually did to him periodically. And eventually, Laomedon's own daughter, Hesione, was chosen by Lot. She was afterwards rescued by Hercules, and there was a very, very complicated story after that. Frank Muir. Don't know. You might. <laughs> <laughs> Who was Callisto? C-A-L-L-I-S-T-O. Callisto. Uh, Callisto was a lady. Yes. Ha, ah, 50% jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Callisto was a lady. She was uh, worshipped by a god yes. who turned her into a lawnmower. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Not even a bed sitting room. <laughs> a lover hyena who turned himself into a marigold, <laughs> got mown down, <laughs> and she was then worshipped by Ajax. <laughs> and uh, what, what are you writing down? One of the muses, I think. One of the muses? Muses. A oh, muses. Uh, um, Callisto was an Arcadian nymph, and she was a companion of the goddess Artemis, the goddess of the chase. Zeus fancied Callisto, <laughs> and in order to carry out his purposes, and I can't understand this, he first turned her into a she-bear. But Hera, who was Zeus's wife, caused Artemis to slay Callisto while she still was a she-bear, 
And then Zeus could nothing he could do except put her into the sky where she is Ursa Minor, the little bear as a constellation. The next round is verse and poetry. And in this round, I give each member of each team a quotation and ask them for the next line or two. Two marks if they can finish off the quotation and two marks more for correctly naming the source. Beginning with Dillis Powell. Yet once more, O ye laurels, and once more, ye myrtles brown, with ivy never sear, I come to pluck your berries harsh and crude, and with forced fingers rude, shatter your leaves before the mellowing year. It's Milton. Yes. And it's Lycidas. Yes. Lycidas has gone before his prime. prime. Yes. Mm. That's all I can do. All right. Uh, that's jolly good. Uh, and three. Three. Like stab. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> These the opening lines of Milton's Lycidas. Uh, yet once more, ye laurels, and once more, ye myrtles brown, with ivy never sear, I come to pluck your berries harsh and crude, and with forced fingers rude, shatter your leaves before the mellowing year. Bitter constraint and sad occasion, dear, compels me to disturb your season due, for Lycidas is dead, dead ere his prime, young Lycidas, and hath not left his peer. So you've got quite a bit of that, three out of four. Dennis Norden. He thought he saw an albatross that fluttered round the lamp. He looked again and found it was a penny postage stamp. <laughs> oh, I can't go on. I'd best it's, be getting it's... home, he said. The nights are getting damp. Yes, well done. Very good. Author? Uh, Lewis Carroll. Yep. Well done. Four marks. Sylvia and Bruno, isn't it? Yes, you've got... Yes, absolutely right. Lewis Carroll's Sylvia and Bruno, and uh, they got it absolutely right. The nights are very damp is how it ends. Four marks. And I and Scott James. They that have power to hurt and will do none, that do not do the thing they most do show, who, moving others, are themselves as stone, unmoved, cold, and to temptation slow. Author first. Shakespeare. Yes. I think it's one of the sonnets. Yes, Shakespeare sonnet 94. I think it's jolly hard to go on with, but can you do any more lines? No. I can't. Can you? No, no. Mm. No. All right, two and a half. I think that was pretty good. Shakespeare's sonnet number 94. It's the opening. They that have power to hurt and will do none, that do not do the thing they most do show, who, moving others, are themselves as stone, unmoved, cold, and to temptation slow. They are the lords and owners of their faces, others but stewards of their excellence. It is a pretty difficult one. Frank Muir. Tell me the tales that to me were so dear long, long ago, long, long ago. We told them before and take it from here. Long, long ago. It's <laughs> <laughs> a song. Yes. Author? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Presuming it wasn't spontaneous combustion, which is unlikely. <laughs> I have no idea in that, my head. And that's, long, abso that's long, absolutely right, yeah. It's right, huh? Yes. Well, I have no... Oh, I know. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, also unknown. <laughs> yes. Tell me the tales that to me were so dear long, long ago, long, long ago. Sing me the songs I delighted to hear long, long ago, long ago. And it's a non or traditional, an old song. Next round is the who, why and what department. Two marks for correct answers. Dennis Powell, can you recognise from the following excerpt what book it comes from and who wrote it? Bernard always had a few prayers in the hall and some whisky afterwards, as he was rather pious. And rather is spelt R A R T H E R. Daisy Ashford. Writing in what book? Uh, the Young Visitors. Absolutely right. Two marks it is. Well done. <laughs> Dennis Norton, can you recognise who wrote this from its style? Money is indeed the most important thing in the world, and all sound and successful personal and national morality should have this fact for its basis. I know that... I know it was earlier or, or later, there was an American author who said that um, the worst thing that we do for our children 
is to teach them that money isn't everything. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's very, yes, absolutely right, similar sentiment, but it I should stick to... It sounds like Shaw. Yes, it is. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> Two marks. It's George Bernard Shaw, the preface to The Irrational Knot. And, of course, in Major Barbara, he said in the preface there much the same thing. The greatest of evils and the worst of crimes is poverty. Now, Anne Scott James, who would you say made the following remark? It is, I think, typical of the person concerned. There are two things I'm confident I can do very well. One is an introduction to any literary work, stating what it is to contain and how it should be executed in the most perfect manner. And the other is a conclusion, showing from various causes why the execution has not been equal to what the author promised to himself and to the public. Not Johnson, yes. is it? Is it? It mm -hmm. doesn't sound terribly typical. Well, it's more typical of the thing like The Lives of the Poets than it is of his conversation. Yeah. Uh, Samuel Johnson, it's quoted in Boswell's Life, Dateline 1755. <laughs> Two marks. You were there. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, uh, of whom was the following written, by whom? And there's a bit of a catch here. Poor Pope will grieve a month, and Gay a week, and Arbuthnot a day, St. John himself will scarce forbear to bite his pen and drop a tear. The rest will give a shrug and cry, I'm sorry, but we all must die. Well, gay, uh, gay Pope and Arbuthnot were three friends. There were four friends. Gay Pope and Arbuthnot were three of them. They were all members of this Scribblerth Club. Um, St. John... St. John was in, too. Yeah, well, St. John was the patron of the fourth friend, who was Dean Swift. Yes. Well done. This is after spending. <laughs> <laughs> it comes from the poem on the death of Dr. Swift, and the catch was that it's written by Jonathan Swift himself. Well, now we come to the last round and go back to those two quotations I gave the teams earlier on in the programme. But two marks, Dillis, can you give me the origin of your quotation? There's a long, long trail a winding. So, First World, First World War. War, yes. Do you First remember War. the author? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Poor author, I don't suppose very many people no. do. Written by a chap called Stoddard King. A long, long trail a winding into the land of my dreams. And now, Anne Scott James, can you give me the origin of your quotation? Was this the face which launched a thousand ships? It refers to Helen... Um, and it's in Dr. Faustus by Marlowe. Yes, absolutely right. Two marks. And now I'm going to ask Frank and Dennis to give me their explanations of how these quotations came to being. And on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever unlikely story receives the longer applause from the audience here in the theatre. So back we go to Frank Muir. There's a long, long trail a winding. I'd like to start with a rather important announcement. If any of you are thinking of camping out uh, in the evenings of next week, do avoid the fields and meadows uh, around the village of Bakewell in Derbyshire. No doubt you'll require some explanation of this. <laughs> but no, it, it all really started... I was sort of browsing and... and uh, just sort of turning things over in my mind in my sort of calm, whimsical, pipe-smoking way. And I was really trying to make a list in my mind of the... Uh, the mankind's worst self-inflicted wounds. And I think really drinks parties captured my imagination. The, the agony and the horror of this drinks parties where one is invited to get together with some friends or locals. I once fainted at one of these parties for the heat. Nothing happened. About half an hour later when I came to, I found I was two stories higher having a fork supper. <laughs> there was just no room to slide to the floor. It really is absolutely frightful. But there's only one party or wine tasting or thing I've ever been to and it really was delightful and that is this perfect host was in fact our host of this evening it's Jack Longland <laughs> now Jack Longland and his wife Peggy live in a delightful stone house in this village of Bakewell 
And Jack is very fond of and is a good judge of wine. And he has a cellar, an arched cellar in his house at Bakewell. I've been there, I went there last year. And this wine cellar is in fact empty. <laughs> it, it has shelves, slatted shelves for the wine, but the shelves are empty. Because what Jack does is every year he has this get-together of people who like drinking wine. And what he does, he hires a trailer. And he gets a farmer friend of his to stand by with a tractor. Now you arrive at Jack's and you immediately change into a boiler suit each. <laughs> so there's no question of slopping gin all over you or burning yourself. I have a dinner jacket with so many burns in it, it's like a string vest. You, know, you, don't, you don't get this with Jack. You strip off your outer things into boiler suits. You, you climb into the back of this trailer where there's an upright piano, a whole lot of wine, nothing on the floor. You can collapse in comfort. You can drop a cigarette and grind it out. When, the, when it gets too hot for comfort, he lowers the flap at the back. An absolute perfect place for a party. Then the master touch. When we're all in there, he gets his farmer friend to tow us by tractor in one of the fields around Bakewell. And then we can sing and we disturb nobody. And then the drill is, we all have half a bottle of one of the clarets and we have a pencil and a pad and we mark it out of ten. And then we have a biscuit and a little cube of cheese to clear our palates. And then we have a little sing-song, and then we mark with a pencil the claret out of ten, you see. Then we have another bottle of burgundy, you see, and then we mark our scorecards with a piece of cheese. And then we, <laughs> then we all get on and we eat a pencil just to clear the palate, and we sing a couple of choruses. And then we drink another half bottle of cheese. <laughs> then we pick up the piano and mark our scorecards. And, 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 and so it goes on, sometimes until ten o'clock. Or if, if it's a particularly lovely morning, half past nine. And, and then we finish, the farmer friend hitches up the trailer. He then has strong friends who lay us in the wine cellar on the empty racks. <laughs> in the cool to sleep it off. Now that is the perfect host. But we do create a bit of a noise with a piano at night. And this thing that Jack organises, you know, with this trailer and with all the wine, it's all a bit noisy. And so that's why we say, that's why the, the reason this important announcement, if you're camping anywhere near Bakewell, do watch out because next Wednesday at 9pm, there's a Longland trailer wine thing. <laughs> I can't wait to get back to my cellar and see if Frank's really nipped all the bottles. <laughs> well, now we go back to Dennis and his quotation, was this the face which launched a thousand ships? I would like to issue a solemn warning to any listeners who may be listening. <laughs> um, some weeks ago, I told you about how I joined a new organization called RSVP the Royal Society for the, for the Verification of Phrases. If you remember, I told you about how I was given the job of verifying the phrase like a bull in a china shop. I had this trouble with the bull at the parking meter, and it, it got rather complicated. Well, now, since then, and this is where I must get rather solemn, we have had a considerable number of letters from listeners 999 letters, no less, in which listeners have told us that they have taken it upon themselves to go out and try to verify phrases <laughs> with the most awful results. Uh, if I may quote a letter here from Mr. J.G., whose address at the moment is cell block B, <laughs> number three gallery, Wormwood Scrubs, <laughs> I set myself the task of determining the exact meaning of the phrase to fall into a brown study. <laughs> it was difficult to find a house which had a brown study, <laughs> but eventually I came upon one in a small private hotel just outside Ilford, 
Accordingly, I rented the room above it and set to work weakening the floorboards. <laughs> After eight hours with a saw and a hammer, I went out for a well-earned wimpy. <laughs> During my absence, the proprietress, a heavy woman, <laughs> shaped like a hundred-watt bulb, <laughs> entered. She is now better equipped than I am to describe the exact sensation experienced in the phrase to fall into a brown study. <laughs> there was another one from a BEA crew, if I may just illustrate these dangers for a moment. Dear Mr. Norden, during a recent flight, a passenger mentioned your name. He suddenly got up, opened the aircraft door and dived out. Just after he entered low cloud, he was heard to shout, Tell Dennis Norden this one definitely hasn't got a silver lining. <laughs> now, we have 999. Like, I, I said, wait a minute, ladies and gentlemen, one more has just come in from Miss H, Miss M H of Woodfield Lane. Dear Mr. Norden, please inform your society that there is one phrase which is as true today as it ever was. You cannot make an omelette without breaking eggs. <laughs> I tried it and took it up to mummy for breakfast. She says the staff at the hospital are wonderful <laughs> and they promise that soon there will be no vestige of eggshell left in her lower digestive tract. <laughs> Now that is a thousand letters, ladies and gentlemen. A thousand people went in for this phrase verification and every one of them met disaster. So please, before kneeling for hours in long wet grass to see whether a worm will turn, <laughs> before trying to dive into Hampstead Pond from a great height to determine whether still waters do run deep. <laughs> Just consider, no less than a thousand people had their chips simply from trying to verify these phrases. So ask yourself first, before you attempt anything, was this the phrase that launched a thousand chips? <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, by your vote, Dennis Norden wins the contest of the two stories. It leaves a final score now in which, nevertheless, Dillis Powell and Frank Muir still win by one and a half marks from Dennis and from Anne. And this also brings to an end this edition of My Word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir and Dennis Norden, introduced by Jack Longland. The programme was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC.